and we're live, welcome everybody to day 15 of Antricode 2022. First off, you see my tree's now there and working, love the tree. Um, and yeah, it's been two weeks of AOC 2022, so I'm excited to see what's in store for us today. You can already see some uh, interesting things going on, going on the other calendar, um, there's no slides, but I think we'll look at that once we've done today. Um, see, so yeah, I have my files, I'll get ready to input, okay. I'm ready to start, so I'll see you after the time lapse. Okay, that's part one done. A really dodgy <laughs> brute forcey method um, to do that. So I'm not too happy with that one, <laughs> but at least it's, it's correct. Um, yeah, so I'll just copy my files over and see what part two has to offer. So see you after the time lapse.
Okay, that's part two done. How long did that take? <laughs> Quite a while. Um, but yeah, lots of stuff to talk about. So let's get straight to the, the question. Let me just ensure my code's actually stopped running. Oh, I think I exited. Never mind. Right, day 15, Beacon Exclusion Zone. You feel the ground rumble again as the distress signal leads you to a large network of subterranean tunnels. You don't have time to search them all, but you don't need to. Your pack contains a set of deployable sensors that you imagine were originally built to locate lost elves. The sensors aren't very powerful, but that's okay. Your handheld device indicates that you're close enough to the source of the distress signal to use them. You pull the emergency sensor out, sensor system out of your pack, hit the big button on top, and the sensors zoom off down the tunnels. Once the sensor finds a spot it thinks it will give a good reading, it reattaches itself to a heart surface and begins monitoring for the nearest signal source beacon. Sensors and beacons always exist at integer coordinates. How convenient. Each sensor knows its own position and can determine the position of a beacon precisely. However, sensors can only lock onto the one beacon closest to the sensor as measured by Manhattan distance. Yeah, he does this every year. Just links to the same Wikipedia page the first time he mentions Manhattan distance. But yeah. There is never a tie when two, where two beacons are the same distance to a sensor. And that's, I guess, where you have to trust Eric's inputs are correct, and they obviously obvious are. It doesn't take long for your sensors to report back their positions and the closest beacons. Your puzzle input. Blah blah. This isn't necessarily a comprehensive map of all beacons in the area, though, because each sensor only identifies its closest beacon. If a sensor detects a beacon, you know there are no other beacons close or close that close or the closer to the sensor. There could still be other beacons that just happen to not be closest. That just happen to not be the closest beacon to any sensor. Example. Um, none of the detected beacons seem to be producing the distress signal. <laughs> oh no. So you'll need to work out where the distress, distress, distress beacon is by working out where it isn't. For now, keep things simple by counting the positions where a beacon cannot possibly be along just a single row. So suppose you have an arrangement of beacons and sensors like in the example above, and just like in a row where y equals 10, you'd like to count the number of positions a beacon cannot possibly exist. Blah blah blah. Consult the report from the sensors you just deployed. In the row where y equals, what is that, 2 million? How many positions cannot contain a beacon? Right, let me just get back into my coding environment, which I exited out by accident. Right, so my solution. Um, yeah, so, I mean, in terms of what the question actually asks, you can just read the last sentence, again, realize there's nothing useful in it. Um, these are all kind of like story sentences, so I just skipped those, um, really fast skim those. And then I did just read the rest because it's a bit confusing. It's not confusing, there's just a lot going on. So I think reading it all was pretty useful for me. Um, also, it's not too hard to understand, right? Like, it, it's really quick to clock how it works. So then, after thinking of an algorithm, I thought of one, um, really slow. You probably saw it run quite slowly. Um, but what it does, it just passes your input. Um, and what it does is it keeps track of two things. So the first dictionary is T. And what is T? T is where every key is the sensor's coordinate and every value is as close as beacon coordinate. And Y is every sensor's coordinate. And the key is, no, sorry, the value of the value of the key, which is every sensor coordinate. So the value is now going to be the Manhattan distance of the closest of the closest beacon. Right, so essentially, for every sensor, T contains the closest beacon's coordinates, and for every sensor, Y contains um, the Manhattan distance of the closest beacon. And that's what like all of this part does. And then what I want to do is just to try and optimize my program, I'm going to find the minimum and maximum um, X coordinates in the entire thing. I ended up being completely wrong about how I should do that. <laughs> um, so you can kind of ignore these two, I guess. Right. This is just to help with using the, uh, the example input. So this is where the code happens. Um, what I'm saying is for every X coordinate, essentially, between the minimum coordinate times 10 or the maximum coordinate times 10. So essentially, for every X coordinate of crawling this mass along this massive, massive plane, because um, obviously we're at a set Y position, we're at a set Y equals 2 million. And so we're kind of checking an infinite X coordinate value. Obviously, you can't check infinite values, so I've just set them to massive boundaries. I've set them to the minimum x value of any given beacon um, multiplied by 10, so it can be really far out the other way, and same for the maximum. So essentially, I'm just creating my own massive window to 
of um, X coordinates to check. And then what I do is I go through every beacon, sorry, every sensor. Um, I'm then checking if my current position, which is going to be X is equal to I from this statement, and Y is going to be 2 million, so just G. Um, I'm checking, what this line checks is it checks, is my current coordinate within the maximum Manhattan distance of every sensor. And if I'm saying, yes, my current coordinate is within the Manhattan distance, then therefore I cannot have a beacon there. And so what I do is I then add this coordinate to V, and V is just going to be a set for all the invalid coordinates. So every coordinate that cannot house um, a, a beacon. But the thing is, some coordinates, like, for example, if you look at this input, um, it says count how many um, coordinates or positions on y equals 10 cannot house a beacon. But you see, there's, there's already a beacon there, right? That's what this list line in my code does. It checks, oh, if there's already a beacon there, then don't add it. Because if there's already a beacon there, then it is a valid position to put a beacon. Um, and therefore, I'm not going to add that to my list of invalid beacon positions. So that's kind of my, my idea. Really <laughs> slow and inefficient. But I think I read that pretty fast. Um, and I mean, it worked. So yeah, let's just see how long that actually took to run. Um, oops, not pi pi 3. Yeah, I mean, that's just my min-max x coordinates. Um, yeah, it's taking a fair, fair while to run. Probably like 5 to 10 seconds. Um, yeah. So, okay, I won't keep this going. It's probably going to bore you to death. So let's just move on to part 2. Your handheld device indicates that the distress signal is coming from a beacon nearby. The distress beacon is not detected by any sensor. But the distress beacon must have x and y coordinates each no lower than 0 and no larger than 400,000? No, that's 4 million. <laughs> to isolate the distress beacon signal, you need to determine its tuning frequency, which can be found by multiplying its x coordinate by 4 million and then adding its y coordinates. Example, blah, 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 blah. Find the only possible position for the distress beacon. What is this tuning frequency? Again, like, this is a pretty short question, so I just read the entire thing. Um, and it's also, again, really easy to understand. But the issue with that is the question itself is really tough. Like, the idea behind it, like the theory, is quite tough. So as easy as the question is to understand, it was still a pretty tough question. Um, so let's just look at my solution. I mean, you probably saw me um, hide like my my Service Pro here, the modern the modern version of pen and paper. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to do some math, taking down some notes, figuring out what, what would work. I mean, coordinate compression sprung to mind. I remember this from what the beacon one. Is it links up here? No, I think it was. Like day 19 last year, day 19 had a similar idea with beacons and coordinates and coordinate compression. That's why I like coordinate, coordinate compression. Um, I'm not going to go over exactly what it, coordinate compression is, but essentially the idea is instead of keeping track of every single value, so if you had like x values 100 to 1000, um, and that was a single line, instead of keeping track of those, those 900 x values, you just keep track of the minimum and the maximum. The minimum is 100, the maximum is 1000. So now your array of coordinates is just 2, as opposed to like 900, because you're only keeping track of the boundaries, the minimum and the maximum, and not everything in between. That's effectively what coordinate compression does in practice. Not exactly what it is, go <laughs> Google it if you're interested. But yeah, um, this code is all the same. This code is largely the same. Um, yeah, so now what I'm doing is I'm. <laughs> I read this a while ago, because this question took me too long, so you just remember. Um, right, yeah, so obviously like with this type of question there's so much going on that you kind of have to um, think of a core idea of how to make your program faster. And the way to do that is by going through each beacon, or sorry, each sensor. Because you're only given a very limited amount of sensors. You're given like, I don't know, how is this, 20 sensors, 30 sensors? Um, and so you go through every sensor instead of going through every possible coordinate. And like 4 million by 4 million is going to be like, I don't know, 16 quadrillion or something. <laughs> And so, my first loop just goes through every sensor, and what it does is it finds the minimum x coordinate and maximum y coordinate. So the minimum x and y and the maximum x and y. So essentially, if you look at your diagram, for something like this, if I was, if my code was going through this sensor in the for loop, it would find this position, this position, this position, and this position. So it essentially finds the corners or the vertices of 
the square or like of this area essentially of all the invalid positions of a beacon um and i mean i thought loads of different ways loads of different ideas came through my mind i don't know why it took me so long to land on the cracked one but i eventually did um so i mean some of this logic is like a bit unnecessary just because my initial ideas were not great um but essentially what all of this does is it then calculates it basically goes through all of the lines, like all of the rows. So if, if S was my sensor here, it would essentially go through that row, then that row, all the way down to the bottom row. And like it would only start at like this one and go down to this one, because I calculated the min, the min Y and the maximum Y. So it goes from the minimum Y to the maximum Y. And then it, what it does is it stores um, the coordinates. Using quarter compression, it stores the coordinates that are invalid. So it stores all these hash tags, for example. So what it would do is for the first one, it would just store this coordinate twice. That's the starter line and that's the end of the line. That's the bound of the line. When it comes to y equals minus one, what's it, what it's going to do? It's going to score this coordinate and this coordinate. Um, just the x positions, right? Because I, I keep track of the y positions through a dictionary. So what I have is I have a dictionary with every possible y row. Um, and I mean, I know every possible y row of the sensor, it's going to be that. Um, so I have a dictionary with the key being the y, the y coordinate and the value it's just going to be a tuple of the range of the x coordinate. So, for example, something like this: the y value to the key, the key would be three, and the value of the key three in the dictionary is going to be a tuple containing what is it, whatever this is, x equals three, and then the maximum is going to be thirteen. So, the tuple is literally just going to contain um, that's going to be the tuple, right? Um, because those are the, those are just like the, the minimum and the maximum points of this line. Um, so instead of storing like every single one of these coordinates, which over time would take a huge amount of storage and huge amounts of time, I'm just storing the minimum and the maximum coordinate compression. So, I mean, what that would look like is that um, in my list, uh, let's say what's the y value? The y value is three. So that's kind of what my list would look like, or my dictionary would look like. It just stores the the line. It stores the lines x values given the y value is the key. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> it's a bit confusing. Um, again, if you want them to see what this code actually does, play around with it. Um, check the link in the description down below. That's my GitHub link, um, and you can find the code, download it, do whatever you want with it. <laughs> um, but yeah. So yeah, I mean this is what all of this code does. I'm not going to go through it because it's a bit complicated and it's late at night and I want to go to bed. Um, so, at this point, at this point here, what I'm saying is I have a dictionary called Q, and it has every possible range. So for every for every row, it has every possible range of y coordinate. It has every possible range of x coordinates. Um, but that also means you might get overlaps. Um, and it's obviously an issue with overlaps because the idea is only to keep the range. You know what, I'll tell you what my overall idea was. So, like, my ultimate aim was essentially, you know the empty space. It's like, say, I think in this example, the empty space was like here, here. Um, so what you know is that every single space other than the empty space is gonna be just an entire row of like hashtags. It's just gonna be entirely invalid. So what that means is every Y coordinate is only gonna have like one line. So once you've gone through every single sensor, every Y coordinate, so every every row is going to be entirely filled with these lines saying eh, eh, no no beacon here um, except one line except that one y line y coordinate one what that one row which houses the answer every other row is just gonna it's just effectively gonna be eh, eh, no beacon um, but the issue with that is that those like those lines saying no beacon within this range they could, they'll be like 10 per row and they could overlap. So what you need to do is you need to like, again, like, I guess compress it back down and ultimately find the range. You need to find the max minimum and the maximum of, um, of that thing. Um, but for the line where there's the answer, you're gonna have two, right? Because you're gonna have two separate lines. So if, you're on, if the answer is on y equals 11 here, for example, on y equals 11 in the dictionary, 
you're going to have two separate lines. You're going to have the line that comes before, then you're going to have the answer slot, the answer corner, where your be uh, the beacon you're trying to find is, and then you're going to have the line that comes after that beacon. Um, if that makes sense. Um, and therefore, you're going to have two separate lines that do not overlap, and therefore they have two completely different boundaries. Whereas every other line will just be a continuous overlap. I'll just have one boundary. Um, because there won't be any spaces in between, because a space in between means there's a beacon there, but there can only be one. So on every other line, there won't be any spaces in between, and therefore, there's going to be a minimum and a maximum, and that's it. But for the line we're looking for, there should be a space in between, and therefore there'll be a minimum and maximum here, and a minimum and a maximum here. So there'll be two lines. Line one, beacon, line two. Whilst every other row will just have one long, really big line. So that's, that's the goal, essentially. Um, and that's why I'm doing all of this. Um, so then, what I then have to do is I then have to like compress everything. That's what this this bit does, and this function that I stole off the internet because <laughs> um, I couldn't be asked to write it myself. So what it does is you could have like five lines on on a row, right? And they they would all overlap each other. But ultimately, what you want is you want the outside bounding boxes, the boundaries of that line. So that's why I find here, and that, that's what this function of the internet does. Um, it takes yeah, merge overlapping intervals. So, say in this example, you have a line from 1 to 3, 2 to 4, 6 to 8, and 9 to 10. Like, this is essentially what my list looks like, right? It's just a, a series of tuples, and each tuple represents the min x coordinate and the max x coordinate. Um, that's what this does, that's what this is, that's what this is, that's what this is. But I want to compress that down to fundamentally one or two lines. Because you see, these, these overlap, so these two overlap. And so, what the code does is it combines those two into just one line, because if they overlap, you don't really care. Like, all you know, all you care about is the fact that there cannot be a beacon there. And therefore they overlap, and this is what the code does. It, it removes the intervals, essentially, and reduces the code back down, reduces the coordinates back down to one line. Except for the row where the beacon is, and that's what I check here. So I'm checking if they're now, if after, the, after I've done all of that interval compression stuff, if there is still more than one line on that row, then there has to be a space because there has to be two lines. So it's going to be, as I said before, it's going to be a line, a space, and then a line. And that space is what we want. So then all I have to do here is I just extract like what the answer wants, essentially. I extract the x-coordinate, which is going to be this. Um, then I multiply it by the number they told us, which is 4 million. Um, and then I add on the y-coordinate. And that would be the answer to the... That would be like the tuning frequency that they wanted us to find. Um, and yeah, I just leave this because um, because once you pass y coordinate equals four million, there are probably going to be a ton of other um, places where this condition is met. And I mean, the question only says go up to y equals four million. So I mean, I probably could have just had a check here, or to be honest, I probably could have just broken this. Um, but like, yeah, but I thought it'd be better um, not to just to ensure to check everything was all right. Yeah, I mean, that was a puzzle for today. I'm just going to run it so you can see how long it takes. Um, that was a puzzle for today. Um, I think I was decent on part one. Yeah, it didn't take too long, to be fair. That's the answer. Um, and you see, the point is, I wanted to check to ensure the white corner is within the range, and it is. And then in theory, the next one that appears should be out of the range. And that is the case. And that just gave me confidence that my answer was right. Because um, I don't want to submit a ton of incorrect answers. And then get massive time out. Especially if I can easily, like, check if my answer seems right, and I could, so I did that. So anyway, today, um, yeah, I think part one was decent. I think I, I wasn't too great on part two. I think I took too long to find like the correct algorithm, and I should have just copied this from the get-go. So I think, yeah, I think I should have just thought of the full algorithm instead of beginning to code it and then think of the algorithm as I went along, because that's what all the commented lines in my code were. It's just where I realized I shouldn't have done this, because um, I was thinking of what to do on the fly. So I think that's what I needed to do. Um, probably saw a couple of breaks because I went to get some food. <laughs> um, and yeah, you probably saw me keep checking the video recording to see how long it's taking. It took like an hour um, for both parts. But anyway, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I'm not too happy with that, but I'm satisfied that I got the answer at least, and that's all that matters. Um, and yeah, yeah, I think that was I think that was a really interesting day, a really good day, really algorithmic, really tough enjoyed that um, and I'm gonna learn some stuff tonight about 
well, tomorrow morning because it's a bit late. <laughs> I'm going to learn some stuff about what exactly I messed up and how exactly it would would have been a faster implementation and like how to do quarter compression manually. Um, but anyway, this is Ivan Calendar. Yeah, I was going to say that. Oh, this doesn't seem to be happening anymore. Yeah, but before, um, before I completed day 15, like this bit over here, this was like changing colors. It's really colorful. Um, I don't really know what that meant. It was a bit spooky, to be honest. <laughs> I don't know, changing colors, like really pale colors. I mean, I see also in this advent calendar, we have a bit of a path forming. I feel like I wasn't there before, was it? Or am I just blind? I don't know. Like, I have a path forming up here, across the bridge, and up here. Um, yeah, whatever this thing is. I don't know what that is. Um, but yeah, also, I don't know what any of this is. I mean, yeah, we've unlocked day 15, but what is this? Is that like meant to represent some sort of beacon or distress signal? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, let's check the leaderboard. Oh, these long times. Yeah, eleven minutes and three. <laughs> oh my god, that is fast. Yeah. I mean, this is also really fast. <laughs> um, part two though. These times are long. Twelve minutes and what is it? Twenty-eight minutes. Twenty-seven minutes. Makes me feel a bit better about how slow, how long I took. <laughs> um, but yeah, these people are really good and really fast, so well deserved to them. And congratulations, I guess, if you're on the leaderboard. Um, yeah, I mean, today shows it's a tough day. Like, 27 minutes for the 100th star. Um, yeah, that shows it's a tough day. <laughs> so let's check, yeah, the stats show that as well. Only 20k people have done it, and I mean, it's almost been a full 24 hours. And yeah. And it's going to start thinning down, to be honest, as they just practically get harder. <laughs> um, let's check out my private leaderboard. Ooh, yeah, lots of people stuck with part two, and that's fair enough. Part two is tough. Um, yeah. But we've got a fair amount of people that managed to do both, so well done. Um, that's nice to see. Of course, classic. Aiden stealing it. Um, Danish right behind him, and then Abin right behind him. <laughs> um, right, oh damn. Aiden was fast, nice. Um, Danish was a bit slower. I think I beat him though. <laughs> um, yeah, Abraham was much slower, but he did part two really fast. Yeah. They did, but they both did. Mm, yeah. I don't know, how was I so slow at part two? Something really messed up there. <laughs> um, at least I wasn't slow as Mr. Gwild. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's good to see. Again, leaderboard's leveling it out. Leaderboard's leveling it out. Um, tough day. Both are pretty good. Lost to learn there. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if you would have done today because it's pretty tough. Hopefully, you could kind of saw my solution, roughly the algorithm I used. Um, always you can look at Reddit, no shame in that, just learning how to do stuff. Um, and yeah, I hope if you haven't done today, hopefully you can do it over the next couple of days, um, figure out how this stuff works, how quantum compression works, all of that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, thank you for tuning in. Probably a long video today. Hopefully my explanation was good enough. If not, again, check out the description for the help link. And yeah, I'll see you tomorrow for day 16, which please, please, please should be easier. So bye and thank you.